The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. Hi, everybody. This is Jason Rosenbaum a political correspondent with St. Louis Public Radio. Earlier this summer, a consortium of media agencies dropped a bombshell report. The federal government had spent decades downplaying or ignoring the risks of radioactive waste in the St. Louis area. And while this issue has been prominent in places like North St. Louis County and St. Charles County for quite some time, The spotlight on the documents revealed in these media reports and the work of activists who have sought to bring attention to it sparked fresh calls for governmental action. Republican Senator Josh Hawley has been particularly outspoken on the issue. He managed to get an amendment attached to a critical national defense bill that could compensate people in St. Louis who became sick. People all over the region contracting autoimmune diseases. Why? Because the groundwater has been poisoned, because the creeks where they played in have been poisoned. And now we know for a fact the government has covered it up for decades. Mr. President, it is time to make this right. Holly's amendment barely passed with a strikingly unusual coalition. Almost all of the Senate Democrats voted for it, while only a handful of Holly's Senate Republican colleagues joined in his effort. I spoke with Holly this week about what his measure would actually do and whether it can make it past the finish line while facing challenging legislative headwinds. Here's my conversation with U.S. Senator Josh Hawley. First of all, can you explain what the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act does and and why it was important to be put in place several decades ago? Well, what, what it does is it was put in place in the Western states, Jason, back in 1990 is when it was it's first put in place. Senator Hatch, Orrin Hatch actually wrote the bulk of it, and it compensates victims of radioactive exposure um, from testing originally in Utah, thus Senator Hatch. So it now covers a series of states as it currently stands, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona. This is all Oppenheimer era stuff. You know, this is Manhattan era stuff. And so what I've said is, is listen, The people of St. Louis were also exposed at the same time and, of course, for decades since, continuing to today, same era, same project. It's the Manhattan Project. And so my goal has been to get the the residents of the St. Louis region. I mean, as you know, it's not just St. Louis proper. It's the whole it's the whole region to get them also compensated, their medical expenses compensated because of uh, the exposure that that we've suffered in our state. If your amendment ends up making an into the final version of the National Defense Authorization Act, how could people in the zip codes that you included in your amendment apply to get compensation if they feel that they became sick due to the nuclear waste exposure? It would it should be very easy. What the what the act mandates is this is that if you lived in these zip codes, and there's a lot of them, it's it's everything around around the, the landfill, Westlake Landfill, around Coldwater Creek, Laddie Avenue, out in St. Charles. Um, and I want to emphasize, Jason, that this is just a first step, too. I mean, we may well need to come back and add more. Uh, and I've, I've said that all along. But if you were in one of those zip codes and lived or worked, went to school there for a period of, of two years or more uh, at any time since the, the late 40s, then you can apply. And the application is there's just an online form where you can go and submit your information. It's administered by the Department of Justice, actually. And then you can be compensated. And under my statute, you can either opt to have a one-time payment or have all of your medical expenses paid for if you have contracted one of the diseases listed in the statute. We're talking about many different forms of cancer, autoimmune diseases, and more. Would people have to prove that there was some sort of nexus between the radioactive contamination and their ailments? And, And the reason I ask this question is I could see hypothetical situations where somebody developed cancer because they lived close to the nuclear contamination, but they also like smoked for years or drank heavily. And I guess you could make an argument that that contributed more to the disease than the nuclear waste. Is that, is, is there anything to that point that they would have to worry about? 
No, they do not have to prove a nexus. The nexus is the known exposure in all of those areas. We know for a fact that there's radioactive waste and contamination in all of these areas uh, that we've outlined, Coldwater Creek, West Lake, Weldon Spring, Laddie Avenue. So if you've lived or worked in those areas and you develop one of the diseases, one of the cancers, one of the autoimmune diseases, et cetera, in the statute, then you can apply for compensation. The burden, here's my philosophy on this, Jason. The burden ought to be on the government. The burden shouldn't be on the folks of St. Louis who have been victims here. You shouldn't have to go in and say, well, well, you know, let me let me show you. I, I can I can prove it. You know, my doctor says, no, if you get sick and you've lived in one of these areas, you get compensated. Where does the money for this fund come from? Does it just come from the treasury? Is there like a special fee that that goes into it? Do the companies that were responsible for some of this pay into it? The fund is pre-existing. It was set up in 1990. It's funded out of federal revenues. Um, it, it So it's in existence now, Jason, and has been continuously since 1990. Um, and it uh, there's there's money in the fund. The government replenishes it at the request of the attorney general who who manages this fund every so many years. But uh, it, it is it's funded out of federal revenues and it is an existing fund. It's there currently as we speak. So I've read a lot of national coverage about your amendment, and oftentimes the the focus is how it passed, coinciding with the film Oppenheimer coming out. I, I would be remiss not to add that the amendment also coincided with a rigorous investigation by a number of news outlets showing that the federal government downplayed and ignored the risk of radioactive waste in some of these effective areas. How much did that investigation kind of prompt you to spur into action here? I think that that investigation is key. And I just want to say in particular for the for the the moms, the Just Moms group, Don Chapman, Karen Nickel, others who work to get 15,000 pages and more of material from the government that had been withheld, Jason, for years. And, and over a period of years, they filed FOIA requests, Sunshine Law requests, got this material from the government, and then shared it with news organizations in the state. And what it showed was the federal government knew as early as the 1960s that there was radioactive contamination, withheld that information, deliberately misled the public. Those were huge revelations and I think really galvanized this. And it, to me, I, when when I read what they had uncovered in terms of just the extent of it, of course, and I, I knew about the radioactive contamination already, been involved with this as attorney general, had worked with Don and Karen for years. But when you see the extent of the lying by the federal government, what I said is, this is the time right now, this is the time with this information to go and get every victim in St. Louis compensated. And that's really what did it, Jason. You know, the, the movie, that's nice. That's an interesting, you know, the, the press likes that. But that but that's not why we got legislation passed. That's not why we're on the threshold of, of getting this done. It's because of these women and some men too, but but let's be honest, it, it's really a group of women who worked and worked and worked on this for years, and you've covered this, who exposed this, frankly, corruption by the government that got us to this point. So is one of the reasons why these types of compensation funds exist, and, and, and forgive me, this is a wonky legal question, but you are a slightly above average lawyer, so you may be able to answer this question for me, is that generally federal agencies have immunity against litigation and what you're doing here and what was done in the 1990s is just an easier way of getting people compensated for governmental wrongdoing than the potentially fruitless effort of trying to sue the federal government. Is that, I want you to address that, that point because it'll lead into my next question. It's a good question. And, and I think that that is, that is in part the intent here. Now I should say that there's no, there's no, there's no um, block here. It's not as if, if people accept compensation for their medical bills, they can't turn around and sue these companies, for example. They absolutely could and and you know are certainly entitled to. Um, but and the the in Missouri, multiple agencies in Missouri have ongoing agreements, uh, uh, settlement agreements uh, d uh, with these different companies. But the point is, yes, here's here's the idea with the with the fund and getting compensated. I don't want people to feel they have to go out and hire lawyers and go to court and go through a multi-year process that may or may not result in a damage award 
when the government ought to make it right this instant. You know, the government did this, and I've been at pains to explain this to people in D.C. I'm saying, listen, the people of St. Louis aren't asking for a handout here. The, the, and by the way, this is also, this is not a natural disaster. The government caused this. The government should make it right. And that's what this is about. I, uh, here's the reason I asked this, because I, when I was reading coverage from particularly the Missouri Independent, some of those activists you mentioned want the state attorney general to sue the federal government, because we're obviously not going to have a situation where the Department of Justice is going to sue another federal government agency. Like, they're not going to do that. Do you think that you're, you're a former attorney general yourself? Is the immunity men- is the immunity issue that I mentioned earlier going to make it really difficult for the state to take action against the federal government, even though there's a lot of evidence that they did a lot of wrongdoing that harmed people in the state? You know, it's a good question, but there are usually ways around that immunity. I mean, I, as attorney general, I sued the federal government multiple, multiple times uh, over multiple issues. And uh, and as attorney general, I also had a, a lawsuit against um, the Westlake uh, landfill um, Republic, uh, Republic Services Company. And we got with them an agreement to build a clinic and for them to be on the hook to uh, clean up the site. Etc. So law, all that to say, lawsuits can do a lot of good. Um, but is it possible to sue the federal government over this? I imagine it probably is. Now I'm saying this off the top of my head. I haven't looked at the statutes, but uh, I certainly do think whether we're talking about the federal government or some of these other corporations over the years who then took over the nuclear waste and negligently disposed of it, uh, that there's a lot of liability here. Yeah, and that leads into my next question because this is a this is a situation where. The, the contamination was caused by private companies working at the behest of the federal government. And I think some of those companies still exist. Some, I think, are owned by other companies. And, and I'm going to be really honest with you. I don't know what the litigation history has been against a company like Mallinckrodt or General Atomics over the last 50 or 60 years. But is it possible for either the state or individuals who have been affected by this contamination to 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 file litigation against some of these companies or has too much time passed for that type of action to really be useful at this point that is a good question jason and i don't know the answer to it particularly as it relates to individuals i I don't know if there's any sort of statute of limitations for example i i wouldn't think i'm just speculating now i wouldn't think that there would be in these sorts of cases but what tends to happen is if you go into court and then attempt to, sh- what you have to then prove is that the companies were negligent, knowingly so, et cetera, et cetera. And this comes back to your earlier excellent point, why a fund for victims is so important. Mm-hmm. It's that for victims to do that, and I'm not discouraging anybody from doing it, believe me, I'm an attorney, I believe in the power of lawsuits, especially against big corporations, but it is a huge burden. And it usually takes years and years and years. And these companies hire fleets of attorneys so, you know, for that reason, individuals ought to be able to go, ought to be able right now to go and get compensated right now to get their medical bills paid for right now to get survivor benefits and to not have to wait in court for a decade to see how that resolves. Now, would it be useful to maybe also sue the companies on top of that? Yeah, might might well be might well be. There has been some requests by Democratic state lawmakers to call the legislature back into special session so they can fund a program from the Department of Natural Resources that looks into what nuclear waste contamination is at this point. And Governor Parson has said, this is a federal responsibility and we should be bringing in the, I would assume the Department of Energy and the EPA to look into this. I And I'm making an assumption here. The reason why I think that there may be some calls to have the state look at it is a federal agency like the EPA or the Department of Energy is so large and it may have so many similar requests that it may be quicker to have a state agency look into what the levels of contamination are as a compared to a federal agency. But I would be interested in your your opinion about who should look to see how much contamination is still there right now. Well, I think we should be crystal clear that the responsibility to clean this up rests with the federal government 100%. This is their mess. And also, Jason, they have jurisdiction over it. I mean, this is one of the frustrating things for the state. And I can say this as a as a former state official is, you know, take just, for example, Westlake Landfill. 
Well, the EPA has control over it. You know, so the state cannot go in and say, oh, we want this done. We want that done. The EPA says, oh, no, 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 this is this is our site. You know, we're going to we, we have jurisdiction to which the response is fine. But then do something about it. You know, same with Coldwater Creek uh, right now. The federal government is supposedly working on cleaning up Coldwater Creek, but it's dragging on and on and on. So, number one, the federal government caused the mess. They need to clean it up. They need to be on the hook for it, and they need to pay for it. There's no reason that the people of Missouri should have to pay to clean up what the federal government has caused. But number two, you know, is there a place for other other people, whether that's the state or uh, independent uh, scientists, to come in and, and to test? I mean, sure. And you know what? Look at Jana Elementary School. We the, One of the reasons we know about the extent of the contamination in that area of Coldwater Creek is because the school board and concerned parents got an outside entity to come in and to test Jana and found that, in, in fact, the radioactive material levels in Jana were much higher than the federal government had previously let on. So, you know, there is a place for that. But I, I suspect that the, to your point about Governor Parson, I suspect that the governor's trying to point out, and he's right about this, is the federal government needs to make this right. This is their responsibility, and they need to do it, and they need to do it fast. All right, so let's talk about how your amendment actually got onto the NDAA, because I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I don't follow like Senate factionalism that much. I have enough issues dealing with that with the Missouri General Assembly, but it is really noticeable that I don't even think a dozen Republicans voted for your amendment, and I think every Democrat ended up voting for it. Why did so many Senate Republicans vote against this? Yeah, this is a great story. What happened was we we have this bill, the National Defense Bill, and I offered as an amendment to the National Defense Bill the legislation to compensate all the victims in Missouri. And you know, and I and I, I got my fellow Republicans to agree to take a vote on that amendment. Then what happened is Senator Ben Ray Lujan from the state of New Mexico came to me and he said, "Josh, you know, I I understand where you're coming from with St. Louis. Terrible what happened there, but you know, I really think that we need to make some changes to this victims fund and we need to expand it for for other victims in the western states." And I said, "Ben Ray, that's fantastic. Let's work on this together." So he and I together wrote new legislation. We took work he had done for years, which was fantastic. We put it together with my legislation for the state of Missouri. We we put together a new thing and we did this in, in the space of literally hours. And then we introduced together the Holly Lujan bill and uh, and we got it attached, Jason. And every you're right, every Democrat but one, Joe Manchin voted no. Every Democrat voted for it. 12 Republicans voted for it. You know, why didn't Repu other Republicans, uh, leadership in my own party, for instance, Jason, I mean, almost all my leadership voted against it, which uh, disappointed me. But hey, my view is, is that they've still got time. You know, I mean, this thing is going to come back to us, I hope, in the final bill. And uh, they'll have time to, to vote the right way then. I hope I can convince them and get them there. But the important thing is we got 61 votes for this in the Senate. And we did this in just a literally a matter of days, major legislation, we got bipartisan 61 votes and we did, we put the whole thing together in just a few days. Um, you know, Ben Ray and I are, are uh, thanking God every day that uh, this came together like this. And now we just got to make sure it gets into the final legis the final bill and passes. You, you have not been shy about criticizing leader McConnell in the past. Do you think that the fact that you were the handler of this bill may have prompted him to tell other Republicans don't vote for this? I think it was the fact that that they they were worried about um, what they took to be the cost of it, uh, which, which, you know, listen, this this is going to it's going to cost money. I'm, I'm not lying about that at all. And it and it should because the federal government think think of all the people in St. Louis who have had to pay out of pocket or through their insurance premiums for decades now. That should have been paid for by the federal government. So is it going to cost the federal government some money? Yeah, it is, because the federal government has cost people their lives. So I think Republicans were worried some about the cost. I think some of them just didn't understand quite how urgent and, and pressing this really is for Missouri and for other states. But hey, this is why I say we've got a chance to uh, convince them again uh, when we take a final vote on this, uh, probably here in another month or two. And and uh, I hope I can convince them. But listen, 61 votes, which is what we got on the floor of the Senate. 
And uh, I stood there, Jason, and and <laughs> it's just old fashioned standing in the well of the Senate, trying to convince people to vote for it one by one. And we got to 61, which nobody thought we could do. And I'll take it. My understanding is that typically the senior members of the committees that handle bills tend to go on conference committees. And I I looked to see, I looked at the roll call vote and I looked who was on the Armed Services Committee. And I think that there are only two or three Republicans that voted for it, including Senator Schmidt and Sen Senator Mullen. But like Senator Wicker didn't vote for it. Senator Cotton didn't vote for it. Senator Ernst didn't go vote for it either. So if some of the people that I just mentioned that voted against it are put on the conference committee, is it going to be up to like House and Senate Democrats as well as House Republicans to make sure that this makes it through the conference committee process? It'll take an all hands on deck effort to make sure this stays in the final bill, Jason, no doubt about it. And I don't know who will be appointed to the conference committee. We're really in the weeds now, but I, I don't know who will be appointed to the conference committee on our side for the Senate. That'll ultimately be a decision for our leadership. But listen, I just have confidence that the more people hear about this, it's going to be really hard to look all of the people in, of St. Louis in the eye and to look thousands and thousands of other Americans in the eye who've been exposed to this radioactive waste and tell them, you know what, actually, no, we don't think you deserve any injustice. No, we think you should just be on your own. Sorry, you know, uh, we gotta go spend some more money on Ukraine, but sorry, we can't do anything for you. I think that is a really hard argument to make. I mean, when the national media has written about the NDAA, they have particularly focused on the differences between the House and the Senate version because the House put in amendments that pretty much bans reimbursements for service members that go get procedures like abortions and also bars TRICARE from paying for gender transition surgery or hormone therapy. I don't think the Senate really dealt with those issues, but I assume that that's going to be an issue in conference. How much do you think that that entire thing could it affect whether the NDAA passes at all and and sort of the, the the future of your amendment, so to speak? I think we will pass a defense bill through both houses of Congress. Congress has done that every year for 70 years, Jason. So I think we will get a final text. Um, will the things that you just mentioned be major sticking points? Yes, I think they will. You know, I will not be on the conference committee, so I will not uh, have a say there. But um, I, I imagine that they will be, and they'll have to they'll have to hash that out. And and uh, I certainly have strong views on on those issues that you just mentioned. Uh, I like what the House did, but listen, my my pitch would just be this: whatever happens there, and again, I, I don't have any control over that. It is absolutely vital that the people of Missouri be compensated for what the federal government did to them, and it is appropriate that it happened with this defense bill, which, by the way, is almost a trillion dollars. I mean, this is an extremely expensive defense bill. If we can spend that much money on military contractors, because that's what it is, we can surely compensate the people of St. Louis who have been wronged. My final question for you, there was an Associated Press article quoting President Biden um, primarily about compensating New Mexico residents that were affected by atomic testing. And I read the article several times. He was clearly referring to the amendment that you were talking about. But the article didn't really mention the St. Louis aspect of this discussion, which is kind of goes to my final question. Do you have like confidence or assurances from the Biden administration that they support the entirety of the by of the Holly Lujan Amendment, including allowing St. Louis residents to be compensated for radioactive waste exposure? I thought what the president said the other day was very encouraging. He was in in New Mexico when he made the statement, which is why he referred to to New Mexico. But his comments that he supported compensating victims and, and supported this legislation, I thought was hugely, hugely significant. And I hope that the members of the House and Senate who will now write this final bill will pay attention to that because you've got to give the president something that he can sign. And listen, I've, I've had many differences with the president. I've made no secret about that. I mean, everybody knows that. But this is a chance to do something for the people of St. Louis, for the people of St. Charles, and for other Americans around the country. They're all working people who have done nothing wrong here, Jason. These are all folks, um, just like in our state, who have worked hard, who have played by the rules, and then frankly, have gotten the shaft from their government. They ought to be made whole. This ought to be made right. And this is a chance to do that. 
And I think the president sees that. I take him at his word. And I think that this is a tremendous opportunity for a major bipartisan accomplishment. So I've got my fingers crossed. If you want to learn more about radioactive waste contamination in the St. Louis area, be sure to go to stlpr.org. I'm Jason Rosenbaum, and thank you for listening. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio.